I began the service um, for, for the benefit of those of you who arrived a little bit late. Um, I began the service referring to the words of Isaiah 55. When we were thinking together about how God's invitation is to anyone and everyone, anyone who is thirsty is welcome to come to the waters. And a little bit later in that chapter, we read this. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So we've been singing, let it rain. Yes, let it rain. Not just so that the fields out there might grow and the harvest might uh, come uh, and that we would have something to eat on our tables, but let it rain with the word of God is what this passage is saying. So we're going to hear our three readings now in faith that through the word of God we will be encouraged but also challenged. Yeah? Let's have the three readings. Anne and uh, Jackie and Vicky, thank you very much. The first reading is from Acts chapter 8, from verse 26 to the end, page 1101 in the Church Bibles. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. I'm reading from 1 John chapter 4, which is on 1227 in the Church Bible. John, 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. God's love and ours. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only, one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he who has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Um, and the Gospel reading is from uh, John 15, 1 to 8, and it's page 1083 in the Church Bibles. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And if a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If everyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers, such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is my Father's glory, that you will bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my, my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. May the thoughts of my mind and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The words we've just heard from John's Gospel give us a vision of a vine, a vine in full bloom, producing its maximal potential fruit. A vine... Um, is something organic and living. Every part of something which is organic and living affects every other part. Unlike an inorganic thing, like my car, like my Aguila, or Agila. Somebody stole the um, hub off one of the wheels, you know, the wheel caps, what do you, wheel hubs. So it looks a bit horrible, that side of it. But, of course, the fact that that's missing has no effect whatever on how my car goes. It still goes beautifully. 
it's an inorganic thing. Not every bit affects every, every other bit in the car. But the vine, a vine, a living organic thing, every bit affects every other bit of the vine. Another example of an organic organism would be a football team. If you've got one player who's slacking, uh, then that affects everybody. You've got one player who wants to get all the goals and all the, all the glory, that affects the whole team. If you're in an orchestra, then if one player plays out of tune, it, the whole orchestra kind of sounds out of tune. That's living organic things. And Jesus is talking here about a living organic vine. But the reality is, as Jesus explains to us, that in that vine there is dead wood, which is weakening the whole life of the vine. So there are two stages Jesus refers to to the process of bringing this vine into complete health that it might produce the maximum possible fruit. The first stage is cutting off branches that are not bearing any fruit. Now, the really important thing that jumped off the page at me when I read this last night, it never hit me before, the really powerful thing is that it is the Father, Father God, so Jesus tells us, who cuts off the branches that don't bear fruit. It's the Father's job. Interestingly, Jesus says, he cuts off me, my Father, in me, what is not bearing fruit. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus is the vine, his Father is the gardener, and therefore if you cut a bit of vine off, you're cutting a bit of Jesus off, <laughs> you might say. We are the body of Christ, so Paul tells us. We are the vine, so Jesus tells us. So having a bit cut off may be necessary, um, but it's actually rather a painful process. It's painful for the branch to be cut off, and it's part painful for Jesus too, because he's part of the vine. He feels the pain of it, but the pain is unavoidable, because the branch has to go, has to be dealt with, for the sake of the health of the whole vine. Now, the problem, my friends, and this is what sprang off the page at me, the problem is this. We want to do the tree surgery. I've never seen that before in 30 years of living with this text. We want to do the tree surgery. But actually, Jesus tells us it's Father God who does the tree surgery. He alone is competent to do it. Rather, we should cry out in humility, Father God, if I'm part of the problem in this vine and causing the whole vine to fail and fail to produce fruit, then please cut me off. It's as radical as that. Now, the deepest human fear, I think, is the fear of isolation, of being cut off. The deepest fear of isolation is being cut off from the life of the community. If you are totally isolated, it leads to death. It's a, a logical fear to have. You can be present in the midst of other people, can't you, but still feel very isolated and cut off. Have you ever felt in that place? You're in the crowd, but you just kind of don't fit in. So you feel isolated and alone, and you're hurting. So it's not just about being physically out there in some other place. You can feel isolated, cut off, even in the midst of others. My friends, none of us have any right to cut anybody else off. Father God is the master tree surgeon. It's his job to do it. How do we cut others off? Sometimes people say to me when I challenge them on this, I don't cut anybody off. 
I, I haven't said anything that bad about anybody. Uh, come on, let's get real. You can cut off somebody by the way you behave when they're around, by your body language. We're told that 70% of our communication is through the way we use our bodies, with who we look at, who we don't look at, whether we do this or whether we do that, whether we do this and welcome them in, or whether, you know, all that stuff, which is part of being human, isn't it? To include other people, you don't have to be just intentional about including them. You have to take positive action to go to them. I watch communities very closely. It's my job to do that. You pay me to do it. I watch communities very closely to see if I can spot with my two eyes who is being excluded and who is being included. To exclude anyone else in any way whatever is to play God. Only he has the right to exclude anyone because he is the master tree surgeon, Jesus tells us. To exclude someone because they don't fit into your group um, is a crime against the whole vine. And so it's actually a crime against Jesus, who is the vine. Mm -hmm. That's what church is. Radically different to what Jimmy was talking about at the beginning in the golf club, where you have to fit into the clique and you didn't realize it, Jimmy, but as you were speaking, another man, a fellow countryman, uh, Bob, was going like this. To get into the golf club, you, you've got to have some money. <laughs> but the church of Jesus Christ is to be radically, utterly different from that. People get excluded for all kinds of reasons. The wrong color of skin the wrong politics, the wrong theology, the wrong accent. Somebody told me once that when I, that when I first came here, they had a trouble with my accent because it sounded so posh. But apparently they've got used to it now, and I'm, my accent's okay. Maybe it's changed and become more Luton. My last church, uh, I was told I was too Essex, and they trouble, had a trouble with my Essex part of my accent. You know, you can get excluded just by, just by opening your mouth with the wrong accent, can't you? Um, but Jesus says in another place, it shall not be so amongst you. It shall not be like that amongst you, my people. You have no right to exclude, to cut off, to isolate anyone, because to do that is to sentence them to death. Only God has the right to do this, and sometimes he does root out sin by cutting off someone for the sake of the growth of the whole. Okay, that's the first part of the process of getting this vine really healthy. Sometimes God, the Father, Master, Tree, Surgeon, has to cut off certain bits. Then he moves on, Jesus, in his teaching, to the second stage. God is the tree surgeon, with saw in hand, if you like, but God the Father is also a master gardener with secateurs in his hand. I learned that word in Cranbrook, secateurs. You use them to uh, prune branches. Jesus is telling us you, his father is a master gardener who prunes masterfully, taking out anything that is not quite healthy. Jesus says, a little bit later in this passage, we are the branches. He is the vine, Jesus is the vine, the father is the, um, uh, the gardener, but we are the branches. So whatever needs pruning back in our lives, the Father will do it. It's painful. It can be very humiliating to be pruned. And a human reaction to being pruned is to leave the vine or to say, rather, don't prune me. I'm fine. Prune him. Prune her. Prune somebody else. All human stuff. Jesus says, 
stay in the vine. If you want to grow and be part of the growth, stay in me, abide in me. You can, he says, excommunicate yourself from the life of the vine, but that will be self-inflicted isolation which leads to death. Stay put, get pruned, move on. How does this process proceed? Jesus is very clear about this. The active agent in the pruning process, Jesus tells us, is the word of God. The word of God. His words. And in Hebrews, chapter 4, 12 to 13, we read this. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's quite powerful, isn't it? The word of God is like a double-edged sword. Now, a few months ago, when we were praying before the service, somebody said in the meeting, Martin, I had a vision. I had a vision of you with a sword in your hand. And I had a vision of you beheading six statues, stone statues, beheading each one. Help, what do I do with that? So for several months I've been praying and thinking about this. I've only got a few, couple of months left with you. I kind of can say whatever I like now. <laughs> So I'm just going to say whatever I like and let God, God be my judge. The word of God is like a double-edged sword. Somebody came with a vision of Martin with a sword in his hand and being commanded by God to strike down six things. Here's the first one today. You already know what I'm saying. Some of you are excluding others. Your thoughts and attitudes of your hearts, so that text to the Hebrews um, says, your hearts, thoughts and attitudes of your heart will be uncovered. God's word is like a two-edged sword, and it's falling down on you. And if you don't include, watch out, because you yourself may be excluded. To exclude anyone yourself, is to risk being excluded. As we heard Anne read from 1 John 1, 1 John 4, if you say, I love God, but you hate your brother or sister, then the word of God says, you're a liar. Okay. This is scary stuff. This is the stuff of human communities. This is the stuff of every community I've ever been part of. So I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to anybody who has ears to hear. In my last church, as you know, I tried to take the pews out. And one poor chap whose name was Tony, a very prominent member of the community, said one day, uh, Martin, if I go with you on this, I will lose all my friends. The pews stayed, and Tony still has all his, all his friends. That's fine. You see, if I include this person as my friend, sometimes, I will lose all my friends. So it's better to include her. No one will notice. Sorry. It's better to include her because uh, she's with me. She agrees with me. But better to exclude him nobody will notice and I'll just keep out of his way but Jesus says you have no right to sign anyone's death warrant you have no right to exclude anybody from the vine that's the father's job now when Margareta and I were in Switzerland just now I had a wonderful revelation 
We all had a wonderful revelation. When I'm in Switzerland, I have to listen to hours and hours and hours of Swiss-German dialect, which I only understand in part and can only respond to in part. I do my best, but after about two hours, uh, something goes, switches off in my head, and uh, I start to retreat, and I go off on my own and start reading my Kindle and all these books I wanted to read. And uh, the other reasons, not just language, is also the things that the, the relations talk about don't always interest me particularly. So I kind of get, find myself excluded. Partly I exclude myself, whatever. But this time, when Margareta and I were just in Switzerland just now, a little boy, who's one and a half, called Benjamin or Benny, decided that Martin needed including. So little Benny kept coming up and, and saying, you are, he didn't have many words, so I don't think he's got any really yet, but he knows my name, Martin, Martin. So he would include me and sort of put my Kindle down and say, <laughs> like this, you see. And then I, I, I get back into the, 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 the chattering, get back included again, and he'd notice I slip off again. He'd come back. Get on board. Get alive, Englishman. And then we went on this great big walk along the Rhine with him and, and his uh, grandparents um, and uh, Margareta. And uh, every now and then, when he noticed I was uh, off on my own somewhere, you would know how I can be, he'd come and include me and pull me back in. It was so precious. Actually, you know, little Benny's a kind of Christ-like figure isn't he? Because that's what Jesus did. When somebody was excluded because they had um, leprosy, Jesus would go out and get them and even touch them. Somebody excluded because they're prostitute, Jesus would, oh, you're being excluded. Bring you back in. Someone excluded because they're a tax collector, sinner, ripping everybody off. Come on, Levi. It's okay. Come and follow me. Then he was like Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? When I was in a, a musician years ago, we, I was in a quintet, a wind quintet. We called ourselves the Ely Boys. We developed our own kind of language. Still English, but we had all sorts of special words that we accumulated over the years so that when anybody came into our group, they didn't know what we were talking about. They couldn't understand our language. Every now and then, the horn player would leave, and, and we'd, we, we would audition other horn players. They didn't take the job. Guess why? because they thought we were exclusive little clique of musicians who developed their own exclusive way of talking. Horrible. I read in the paper that a young Estonian man fell in love with the English language, and he had a, a desire to be able to read everything in Shakespeare in the original language, and he studied and studied and studied and became a master of the English language, and he went down to Oxbridge, to Oxford, because he thought there, there would be all these wonderful English scholars immersed in Shakespeare. Do you know what the students said to him? Some of you might have read this. Do you know what they said to him? Go back to effing Estonia. In the human DNA, we now know today that we have failing genes, not blue genes, failing genes, familial predispositions to certain illnesses. We behave as we do and get ill in the way we do, sometimes because certain genes fail. Something's gone wrong in the system. And I want to say to you this morning that the failing gene common to most humans I've ever met is what I would call a tribal gene. A gene that wants to find its a person that causes a person to find their identity in their own little group, their own little clique, their own little tribe, keep others out. It's something common to all human beings, all races. We all suffer from this. We've all got this failing gene in us, in my view. 
We make a fatal mistake, three fatal mistakes with this. The first fatal mistake is to think that if you've had enough education and you've traveled enough, and then we're all going to be one big, lovely, happy family on earth, the big society. But you know, supremely sophisticated cultures are just as prone to the tribal gene as those who've had no education and is stuck in poverty. Look at Germany, one of the most sophisticated nations on earth wonderful music, wonderful literature, wonderful philosophy, amazing nation, produced the Nazis. So that they decided that in the interest of cleaning their vine out so that it would bear much Aryan cultural fruit, they had to get rid of gays, Slavs, Roma, handicapped, Jews, dissidents, anything they didn't like. This is the tribal gene writ large. This is the tribal gene that says, if something we don't like, something in our closed group, we will just gas them. That gene is in me and in you too. Sorry, it is. Because there's plenty other examples of history, from human history, that will bear that out. Isn't there? That's the first fatal mistake, to think, oh, we're not quite like that anymore. The second fail, fatal mistake is to think, well, we've dealt with it, Hitler's in his grave, and it's all been done. But the only one who can actually genetically sanctify us, who can deal with this tribal gene, is the Lord God, our maker himself. Lord have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. We have a failing gene. We are tribal people. And only he has the saw and the clippers in his hand. Only he is the master tree surgeon. Only he can cleanse us of this flaw in our makeup. So that's the second fatal mistake. We've dealt with Hitler. It's all been done. Fatal mistake. The third fatal mistake is this. Oh, Martin doesn't like it when people are nasty to his beloved Roma. He's got a bee in his bonnet. Actually, he has got a bee in his bonnet. He doesn't like it when people are horrible to the Roma people. He tries to help that situation. But you know something? Martin's also concerned about lone women who creep in at the back of our church for, and for fear of being excluded and leave early from church because they're fearful of being excluded. Martin has got a bee in his bonnet. I've never been anywhere where it's not like this, to some extent or another. You know, I believe that we all have the potential to become like that Swiss toddler, Benny. We all have the potential to sense the alienation of the excluded one, to feel their pain, to get alongside them, and to want to include them. We all have the potential to become like that. I believe that sin around us corrupts us from our earliest childhood, and we start to pick up who we are supposed to avoid and who we are supposed to include. It's quite possible that little Benny, when he's 10, might not feel so friendly towards funny Englishmen as he does right now. That will be a no normal development because we pick up from each other, don't we? We pick up from each other who's the in person and who's the person to keep out of the way. I believe that all of us have been corrupted from early childhood to some degree or another in this way. We get robbed 
I believe, of our original innocence. But I believe that God can rekindle in us a spirit of inclusion. But it's going to take a miracle. God's spirit causes miracles. God's spirit touched that man, Philip, to jump out of his comfort zone when he was on mission, run up alongside a carriage bearing a black man from Ethiopia who happened to be reading the Old Testament, as we would call it, didn't understand what it was meaning. God's Holy Spirit said to him, to Philip, go and include that poor man. Include him in what you've heard. Include him in the good news. Share the good news with him. Go up. I know it's embarrassing going and talking to a black uh, eunuch. <laughs> I know it's embarrassing, but do it. Because your father wants, to, God wants to include that man. He did it, and the church came into being, the first church in Africa, in Ethiopia. All sorts of stories like this in the book of Acts. Think of Peter, who had been reared from childhood to think he could only have fellowship with fellow Jews. It took a miracle to change his worldview. It took a miracle when he was there on the rooftop and he saw a vision of the angels lowering down a sheet and saying, Peter, get up and, and, and eat whatever you like. There's no more kosher foods, special foods for you. Just eat. Peter wrestles with it. It takes God three times to change his heart. But in the end, he comes down and it leads to him having fellowship with Cornelius, a Gentile. Even having f table fellowship, having a meal with Cornelius, a Jew and a Gentile, eating together around the same table. I watch every community and I watch where people sit at meal table and I see these exclusions going on. We all have this failing gene within us and it takes nothing less than a miracle, a move of God's Holy Spirit to reprogram us after the pattern of Jesus Christ who included the unincludable God, the scriptures tell us, has no favorites. We're not to have any favorites either. So help me God. So the sword of God's word is over us. The father is poised with his saw and ready to cut off and to prune whatever needs dealing with. Nothing, the scripture tells us, in all creation is hidden from God's sight. I only see a tiny bit. You only see a tiny bit. God sees it all and wants to deal with it. Why? Why? You might say, why bother? Why not just leave us to our tribes, to our exclusive clubs, as Jimmy was talking about? Why don't we just be like a golf club? have only people that fit into our little clique. Why not just carry on like that? Jesus gives us the answer. If we do that, we don't bear any fruit. There is no fruit on earth. The whole message of the vine, John 15, the whole message is that the vine, which is Jesus, the whole vine is to bear fruit. Much, much, much fruit. He is the vine. His father is the gardener. Does the pruning and the cutting. We are the branches. The grapes come on us. And the more sanctified and holy we are, the more fruit we will bear for the kingdom of God. So we're going to put it into action now. As I said, you can't just be intentional. You have to be actively do it. So we're going to do it now.
Would you all stand, please? You have a choice to make now because you're going to share the peace with somebody. <laughs> this is the outward expression of what we're talking about. It's only the beginning. It's only a little, little taste of what Jesus had in mind. But when we share the kiss of peace with one another, we're laying hold of the miracle Jesus performed 2,000 years ago on the cross when he died, shed his blood, that we might be one and that whatever divides us from one another would be conclusively dealt with forever. Do you see? He shed his blood on the cross that all might be included. No one excluded. It's been done, but we have to live in the, in the consequences of what his sacrifice and what he did for us all. Yeah? So this is more than just, oh, how are you, Diane? How are you? It's much, much more than that. So, I'm going to say to you the, the peace, and I invite you to go, I invite you to go to the person who you find it harder to share the peace with than the easiest person. Go to those people first. Lord God, have mercy on us. We want to be a holy vine. Lord, have mercy on us. Jesus stood amongst them. And he said, Peace be with you. Again he said to them, My peace I give you. And he showed them his wounds. And the disciples were filled with joy. So, I say to you, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another a sign of the peace.